understanding eating disorders in patients with comorbid substance use disorders with Dr. Timothy Brewerton. My name is Dr. Terry Fasihi, and I'm your moderator today. If you have any questions or concerns about this webinar, please contact Don Gannon uh, via email, dgannon at aedweb.org, or you may call 703-234-4125 in the US. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. All participants are muted with the exception of Dr. Brewerton and myself. This webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes and is being record recorded. It will be posted on the AED website shortly after we do it for AED members to download at their convenience 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In just a few minutes, Dr. Brewerton will begin his presentation, after which he will answer questions from the audience. Please feel free to submit your questions to him while he is presenting using the chat text box on the bottom right hand side of your screen. And then I will read them to him when the question portion of the webinar begins. Dr. Brewerton, let's please check your volume quickly. Can you just say a few words? And if a couple of the participants could let me know if you hear him clearly by sending a message in the chat text box, then we can get started. Thank you, Terry. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm looking forward to sharing uh, this webcast with you on understanding eating disorders in patients with comorbid substance use disorders. How's that sound? Okay, Liz and Jamie are indicating that they hear you loud and clear. Thank you so much. Great. Let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Brewerton. He is clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, where he's also in private practice. Dr. Brewerton is board certified in general child adolescent and forensic psychiatry, as well as addiction medicine. He is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. He is a founding fellow and former board member of the Academy of Eating Disorders, former president of the Eating Disorders Research Society, current member of the AED Research Practice Committee, he is author of more than 150 articles and book chapters, editor of the Clinical Handbook of Eating Disorders, an Integrated Approach, published in 2004, co-editor of Eating Disorders, Addiction, and Substance Use Disorders, Research, Clinical, and Treatment Perspectives, published in 2014. He has reviewed over, for over 50 scientific journals and serves on the editorial boards of the International Journal of Eating Disorders, Eating Disorders, the Journal of Treatment and Prevention, and Eating and Weight Disorders. It is my pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Brewerton. Thank you, Terry, and hello, hello again, everyone. I'm going to jump right in and uh, begin and give you an overview of the presentation today. I'm going to be uh, talking about the overlaps between eating disorders and substance use disorders and the commonalities between them, particularly as it applies to etiology and mechanisms. I'm going to cover something about epidemiological aspects and then talk about differences between eating disorders and substance use disorders. I'm going to review uh, muscle dysmorphia, which technically is not an eating disorder but is related. I'm going to be talking about uh, the new term in DSM-5, which is substance-related and addictive disorders, uh, and what implications that have uh, or has for exercise and food and other uh, behaviors. I'm going to be talking about the very important triad of eating disorders, substance use disorders, and trauma PTSD, which has been a long-standing interest. <clears throat> 
as well as other comorbidities and the uh, idea about complex PTSD. I'm going to talk about assessments uh, for alcohol, drug, food, and trauma and PTSD. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, end by talking about the evolution of treatment frameworks. Uh, this is part one of a part two presentation. Uh, today we're going to be largely talking about understanding uh, this, these relationships. And the next part, which will be April 30th, we'll be talking about treatment and integrated treatment philosophy. So eating disorders occur definitely more frequently in substance use disorder populations than in the general population. And the highest reported rates of co-occurrences are in individuals with bulimia nervosa and alcohol use disorders. The National Comorbidity Survey Replication Study found that lifetime rates of any substance use disorder in eating disorder subgroups was between 23 and 37%. The National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse estimated about half of women with eating disorders abuse substances. Binge eating and subthreshold eating disorders have also been more likely to occur in individuals with substance use disorder than in those without. And the strongest associations are again between substance use disorder and eating disorders involving bulimic behaviors, such as binge eating, purging, and laxative use. Women with either a substance use disorder or an eating disorder were more than four times as likely to develop the other disorder as were women who had neither disorder. Uh, what you see before you is a list of common substances that tend to be abused by eating disorder patients. Uh, anywhere from laxatives, diuretics, Things like Ipecac, which is luckily no longer over the counter, uh, Orlistat, a fat blocker, caffeine and energy drinks, stimulants, over the counter diet pills and supplements, nicotine, opioids, thyroid medications, insulin, alcohol, and marijuana. <clears throat> it's important, I think, to uh, note that the first six or really included in the DSM-5 criterion for uh, bulimia nervosa, the B criterion, which talks about recurrent inappropriate compensatory behaviors in order to prevent weight gain, such as self-induced vomiting, mis but misuse of laxatives, diuretics, or other medications. So within the criteria of bulimia nervosa, we have the use of certain medications that people use in particular for weight loss. I want to, uh, in particular, note energy, energy drink use, uh, which have very high concentrations of caffeine, and some are combined with alcohol. And there have been a number of deaths reported uh, over the last several years with people really abusing energy drinks. They uh, are associated not only with alcohol and other substance use disorders in high school and college age students, over 40% of high school students report recent use. And energy drink use predicted lifetime alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, which is, I think, an incredible finding. Moderate to heavy energy, energy drink users are more likely to report using each of 13 substances across a variety of classes of substances. So it has very high predictive value. Uh, energy, energy drinks with, uh, that are low calorie or diet energy drink use is also associated with concerns about personal appearance, weight loss attempts, and disordered eating behaviors, including dieting and the use of diet pills, vomiting, and laxatives. Uh, among the commonalities that I want to talk about today between eating disorders and I'll use the new term substance related and addictive disorders are there are animal models that uh, bridge the gap, there are genetics and heritability data, there are neuroimaging results, there are uh, findings about emotional dysregulation and overlapping comorbidities as well as personality traits 
higher rates of prior big T traumas, as well as uh, the con concept of food addiction, which I want to discuss as another bridge. In terms of the animal models between eating disorders and substance-related addictive disorders, I'll call them SRADs, uh, feeding and drug-seeking behaviors overlap considerably in the animal literature, and both have a heightened reward sensitivity. Hedonic eating is common to animal and human models of binge eating. And there is also an activity anorexia, uh, which is probably the best animal model for anorexia nervosa, in which food restriction and weight loss enhances dopamine release in the limbic system in response to exercising and other rewarding behaviors. Animals who are forcibly restricted uh, increase their exercising, and some increase it if left to their own devices to the point where they're exercising most of the day and to their death. There's also a literature about starvation dependence as a, as a modeling uh, or a model for dieting behavior in both animals and humans. In terms of genetics and heritability, uh, earlier studies suggested that eating disorders and substance use disorders had independent transmission. But more recent twin studies suggest that there is a shared or are shared genetic factors and that the genetic correlational range between these two sets of disorders is uh, anywhere between 0.23 and 0.53, which uh, is you know, quite, quite substantial when uh, they are higher also when limited to eating disorders with compensatory behaviors and substance-related and addictive disorders, up to 0.61 in terms of correlation. There are a lot of uh, personality traits that uh, overlap between eating disorders and uh, SRADs, particularly impulsivity, the concepts of novelty seeking by Cloninger, sensation seeking by Zucker, uh, disinhibition is a form of sensation seeking and has been written about in terms of negative urgency, negative emotionality as well, and then certain personality disorders or traits, typically of the cluster B variety, borderline and, and antisocial, have also been linked. Neuroimaging results uh, with a focus on eating disorders with bulimic features i.e. binge eating and or purging, as well as those with high scores on the Yale Food Addiction Scale, shared dimensional neural commonalities, in particular demonstrating diminished executive control and heightened reward sensitivity. Emotional dysregulation is a broad term that can encompass a number of different components, including alexithymia, or the problems with emotional identification or emotion identification and describing emotions. Uh, regulation, negative mood and affect regulation, negative emotionality, it goes by different terms in, in the literature. And then behavior, emotional eating has been a term that's appeared as well as impulsive eating and behavioral disinhibition around eating as well as substances. The self-medication hypothesis is alive and well. It's been uh, substantiated in a variety of ways for both sets of disorders. And uh, people may know about ecological momentary assessment studies where people carry around what used to be a Palm Pilot. It's now uh, phones that where they uh, assess emotions and behaviors in the moment uh, and compile tens of, tens of thousands of data points to understand what's going on emotionally and behaviorally at any given moment in uh, relationship to these behaviors. Um, both eating disorders and, and SRADs are each associated with higher rates of childhood uh, maltreatment, including sexual, physical, and or emotional abuse, as well as other prior big T traumas, compared to individuals without eating disorders or SRADs. Evidence suggests that the comorbid eating disorder SRAD patient has even higher rates of big T trauma and multiple traumas, which we'll discuss uh, a little bit later. 
the types of trauma, these are, this is uh, probably the best study done to date in terms of the types of trauma by eating disorders in women and men. It gives you an idea of how common trauma is in eating disorders. And this is uh, uh, Karen Mitchell and colleagues in the International Journal in 2012. You can see uh, statistics that are often shocking to people, but 100% uh, of bulimia nervosa subject, those with subject, these are these are non-clinical, non-treatment seeking subjects. 100% uh, of those with bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa had any type of trauma compared to 79%. Trauma is certainly common in the, in the non-ED population and the general population, but it's particularly high in the eating disordered population. And the majority of folks have had some form of interpersonal trauma which is uh, perpetrated by another person. Whereas uh, the minority of non-eating disorder folks have this kind of trauma. Men, it's uh, just as high or higher uh, <clears throat> for any type of trauma as well as interpersonal trauma. Look at those, with those men with bulimia nervosa. Again, the majority have any interpersonal trauma compared to uh, a minority of those with non-eating disorders. So there are also overlapping comorbidities besides uh, these two between eating disorders and SRADs. Uh, they have, both have higher rates of mood disorders, other anxiety disorders, PTSD, OCD, ADHD, impulse control disorders, as well as personality dimensions and disorders as we've alluded to before. In terms of the rough epidemiology of what we know about eating, the relationship between eating disorders, substance use disorders, PTSD, uh, we have, I've made this slide. Uh, and so a lot of times uh, we have patients who present with both eating disorders and substance use disorders who have underlying trauma and PTSD. And the, the, the studies have shown anywhere between 37 to 52% of eating disorders have PTSD. It's extraordinarily high in substance use disorders as well, as many as 60% or higher. Um, but we don't know a lot about the rates of eating disorders in PTSD population, although we do have high rates of substance use disorders. We also have at the bottom uh, fairly substantial minorities uh, particularly in eating disorders and PTSD of those who fail to recover. And we know about the emerging literature about um, uh, uh, SEAN, um, severe and um, severe um, eating disorders, se severe and enduring, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, eating disorders, severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. We see that there are high rates of people who don't respond or fail to recover. I think we've all dealt with such folks. I want to um, note differences between eating disorders and SRADs. Body and shape concerns are not typical features of SRADs. However, low self-esteem is common to both and body shape concerns are linked to low self-esteem. Poor body image uh, self-esteem was a predictor of alcohol and drug use among female adolescents in a couple of studies. Now I want to talk about muscle dysmorphia, which is a subtype of body dysmorphic disorder that has been linked to both eating disorders and anabolic androgenic steroid abuse, predominantly in men, but certainly not exclusively. Muscle dysmorphia has been referred to reverse anorexia or bigorexia in the past. And it is a disturbance of self-perception in which individuals are obsessively preoccupied with the belief they are too small, too thin, or insufficiently muscular. They are actually more likely to have a higher proportion of lean body mass than the average person. Muscle dysmorphia shares characteristics not only with eating disorders in terms of their persistent attention to intake and compensatory behaviors focused on control, but uh, obsessive compulsive disorder with excessive body monitoring and physical activity, 
and body dysmorphic disorder, in, including extreme attention to outward appearance. MD is frequently associated with various types of substance abuse, and most notably appearance and performance enhancing drugs, which are termed APED. Steroids classified as Schedule III controlled substances by the Anabolic Steroids, Steroid Control Acts of 1990 and 2004 are the most widely sought after and abused appearance and performing enhancing drugs. Dependence syndromes and progression to other recreational drugs such as opiates or potential long-term consequences. And I think eating disorder professionals uh, need to be on the lookout for these folks. Moving on to uh, exercise, I want to talk about uh, pathological exercise or excessive exercise. This is a study that I was involved in with Haley Cunningham, published in IGED 2016, in which we g gave uh, to a large group of subjects both uh, addiction scales as well as compulsive uh, exercise scales, more those with paradigms using exercise as an addiction and paradigms using exercise as a, an obsessive compulsive uh, behavior. And the point here is that they're all correlated with each other. And to some extent, um, this is a matter of semantics, whether we call it an addiction or call it a compulsion. Uh, uh, very highly correlated. And we see that uh, excessive exercise can exist in primary forms. And 1.4% of the participants met criteria for primary excessive exercise. And most of them, though, 5% were secondary to an eating disorder. For almost 15% with eating disorder symptoms had excessive exercise, uh, as noted by any one of these um, instruments. And almost 19% of athletes exhibited excessive exercise, as uh, determined by one of these in uh, instruments. <clears throat> Many of us have watched the Olympics, the Winter Olympics recently, and we, you may have read in the news about how uh, there were some athletes who were not allowed to participate because they needed to be hospitalized for their eating disorder. Uh, it also came up with a number of athletes uh, and their past histories of eating disorder, their struggle with eating disorder and eating disorder related issues. And we know that they exercise often to excess and that's often the price of, of winning. Uh, so it's, it's an issue out there uh, recently. There are other shared clinical features between eating disorders and SRADs. Uh, loss of control, cravings or urges, such as to binge or to use substances, ambivalence, which is often labeled as denial. We try to stay away from that, that term now. Uh, guilt, shame, and failure at self-control is common, and it leads to secrecy. So it's important to ask about substances. It, there is data that show that eating disorder programs sometimes don't evaluate for substance and related addictive disorders very well. And the same is true for substance abuse programs or addiction uh, services. They don't really uh, assess well for eating disorders. These are both highly stigmatized disorders. People uh, often think that you should just snap out of it and they have very limited understanding of the, uh, th these disorders and what uh, drives them. They, of course, are both self-destructive behaviors uh, or, or self-destructive behavior-related disorders. Both uh, involve using behaviors to relieve tension, at least momentarily, and they provide an escape. And failure to engage in the behavior increases anxiety. And so this, again, is part of the self-medication hypothesis for both. There are associated consequences, such as family dysfunction, can be secondary or primary or both often. Uh, medical consequences with increased morbidity and mortality for both. There are psychosocial sequelae and decreased quality of life, uh, and in including employment and academic disruptions. 
Uh, some notable clinical features of uh, patients with both is eating disorder severity increases, the number of substances abused increases. Childhood uh, or adult adolescent onset of binge eating is associated with higher prevalence rates of alcohol abuse, nicotine use and abuse, crime victimization, and PTSD. The greater number of purging types is associated with higher lifetime rates of alcohol abuse dependence, major depression, crime victimization, and PTSD. And greater histories of trauma and trauma dose across childhood and adult development is often re referred to as complex trauma associated with then complex PTSD. Uh, certainly, uh, Lacey in you know, some, time, some years ago talked about and wrote about multi-impulsive bulimia, which included uh, alcohol and drugs, as well as histories of trauma. But uh, we know that there is greater comorbidity, whatever, whatever term we use to refer to these complicated disorders or complex, comp complex combinations of disorders. There's evidence that folks with both are harder to engage in treatment and have higher rates of treatment dropout. So they are quite challenging to the clinician, no doubt. This shows uh, some. This shows a paper from uh, or a figure from our paper in uh, IJED 2014 about early onset uh, having higher trauma, higher rates of. Uh, nicotine abuse and, and, and currently smoking, alcohol dependence and abuse. This uh, is a figure from our paper about number of purging types. So just asking people um, how many types of purging they've engaged in in their life. This is lifetime history of purging types. So vomiting, laxative abuse and diuretics are what we're talking about here. So people who, in, who endorsed engaging in all three had by far higher rates of lifetime alcohol abuse. And the same is true for lifetime alcohol dependence. Those who endorse all three purging types have very high rates. You can see uh, over 50% of those endorsing all three have lifetime alcohol dependence. So I call this the trifecta or an important triad, eating disorders, substance use disorders, and trauma and PTSD. And I think if you're going to be treating uh, alcohol and substance use disorders, then you're inadvertently going to have to deal with trauma. It's often hidden by the eating disordered and, and uh, substance using behaviors, addictive behaviors. But there's a lot of data to support this uh, underlying issue. Um, so eating disorder patients who report prior abuse are more likely to report alcohol as well as suicide attempts, shoplifting, higher scores on the Beck depression inventory, and higher measures of eating disorder psychopathology. We've known this for a long time. In a, in a representative sample uh, in the National Women's Study, individuals with both bulimia and PTSD had significantly higher rates of alcohol abuse and dependence. And both PTSD and major depression uh, mediated the relationship between bulimia and alcohol. Using the National Comorbidity Survey replication data, lifetime prevalence of any DSM-4 substance use disorder was highest in individuals with any uh, eating disorder and any PTSD, especially true in men. And these are the, the data showing that. So you can see any uh, these are rates of any substance use disorder, DSM-4 defined, in men and women with uh, no ED, any ED, PTSD only, and any ED and PTSD. And uh, what was really surprising here is the extraordinarily high rates of substance use disorder in men who have both an eating disorder and PTSD. Uh, this matches up often with uh, the idea of complex PTSD, which is, is somewhat of a uh, controversial term. But um, 
the International Society for the Study of, of Trauma and Dissociation, as well as the International uh, Society for the Study of Traumatic Stress, both talk about complex PTSD. And this is a, uh, a, a nice figure that I like showing that the trauma dose, particularly looking at childhood traumas on the right and adult traumas on the left, it has a cumulative effect in terms of the complexity of symptoms uh, and the notion of complex PTSD, which includes uh, eating disorders and alcohol drug abuse. Uh, Van der Kolk is probably the first person in 2002 to include eating disorders as well as drug abuse in his uh, definition of complex PTSD along with these things that I've mentioned before, af problems with affect regulation, uh, amnesia, dissociation, somatization, alterations in relationship to self, distorted relations with others, and loss of sustaining beliefs. Now, this overlaps uh, in a lot of people's mind with borderline personality disorder, but my philosophy is not to make that diagnosis in the face of flagrant, what we used to call axis one disorders. And a lot of these so-called personality disorders really disappear when you treat the axis one disorders more aggressively. But we see that big T trauma definitely uh, leads to PTSD and what is termed complex PTSD, where you have elements of all of these different uh, disorders not just eating and substance, but as we said, mood, anxiety, dissociative, somatoform, impulse control, disruptive behavior disorders in kids, as well as predominantly cluster B personality disorders and traits. Uh, a notable um, feature of this kind of person or patient is greater suicide risk, which is a major cause of death in eating disorder populations. And this is an important study done by uh, the uh, NIH-funded Genetics of Anorexia Nervosa Collaborative Study, lead author Cindy Bulick. Some of you may know her. Who doesn't, right? Um, and we had significantly fewer persons with restricting type who reported greater than one or more uh, suicide attempts compared to those with uh, bulimic forms of anorexia, purging, binge eating, or binge purge. And once you control for major depression, suicide attempts were associated with uh, substance abuse, impulsive behaviors and traits, cluster B, uh, personality disorders, panic, PTSD, and higher ED severity. So we know suicide attempts are in anorexia are common, but when you particularly have this uh, these comorbidities, in particular this triad, they are um, very much important to identify. The su suicide, suicidal ideation is important to identify. Uh, often uh, people with anorexia who are greater suicide risk have definitely the intention to die. Uh, it occurs less frequently in those with restricting form and it's associated with these features, as I've mentioned, and I've diagrammed these here in this slide. And you can see uh, this complex uh, array of psychopathology that is associated with <clears throat> eating disorders, severe eating disorders, substance abuse, and PTSD, as well as these other features that we've talked about. But suicide, of course, uh, is very important to deal with and recognize and prevent. I want to move on and talk about food addiction as a concept. It's a very controversial term in the eating disorder world, not so much in the addiction world, um, but it has increasingly become a useful and defensible clinical entity with marked implications for policy practice and research. And we're talking about highly palatable, ultra-processed food with high sugar and high fat content that are postulated to act via similar mechanisms as both illicit and licit drugs of abuse in the brain. We're talking about pretty much acting on the dopaminergic uh, system or reward centers of the brain. And a lot of this has been facilitated by uh, Ashley Gerhardt 
and Associates, who's initial, initially at Yale, but now at Michigan, uh, and the uh, Yale Food Addiction Scale, which has very good test, retest, reliability, and validity. It's been, uh, they've been uh, studied in children, and they've developed a, a child version, as well as a DSM-5 version called the YFAS-2. Basically, they have taken the criterion, the DSM-5 criterion for substance use, and they have substituted uh, the word, they've substituted food or overeating in place of substance or abusing. Uh, and you can, this is an actual uh, first half, first 15 questions of the Yale Food Addiction Scale version two. Uh, it's straight out of the DSM. Um, and it's important to note that um, we're not talking about all foods. We're talking about certain foods, and, we're, and it tends to be highly processed foods, ultra-processed foods. And there tends to be a consistency in terms of which foods people who uh, identify themselves as food addicts uh, note things like ice cream and cookies and cakes. Um, it's an important concept, I think, that has very cl uh, good clinical utility because when I when I got interested in this, uh, it's you know it, this overlap between eating disorders and addictions. Uh, a lot of it was driven by this emerging science of food addiction, and when I started asking a lot of my patients, did they consider their eating disorder an addiction? I got this overwhelmingly positive response. Uh, yes, how did you know? That exactly captures it. And a lot of people have also come in uh, to my practice saying right up front that they uh, have trouble with food addiction. And so I, rather than just poo-poo that idea or minimize that idea or, or, or uh, uh, shoot it down, I think it's really important to incorporate and understand the, the patient's percep perception of their disorder. So there are 35 questions. This is the second half. Um, this is readily available uh, through Ashley Gerhardt, who, who is happy to hear from people who want to use this scale. Just contact her. She's a member of the Academy. Um, <clears throat> what's notable is that the YFAS has been used in uh, studies of large groups of individuals with eating disorders, and strong associations have been found with bulimic eating disorders, especially. Those eating disorder patients who meet food addiction criteria have much greater eating disorder psychopathology. In one study of 125 uh, patients with a variety of eating disorders versus 82 healthy controls, the YFAS Spanish version showed good discriminative capacity to distinguish e between eating disorders and healthy controls and a good sensitivity to screen for specific eating disorder subtypes. The highest prevalence was in uh, binge purge anorexia nervosa and then bulimia nervosa. We're talking 86%, 82%. Binge eating disorder, 77%. The lowest prevalence uh, in restricting anorexics, 50%. Although, you know, a lot of people with restricting type of anorexia will say they're addicted to food when in fact they're, they're really not. Uh, they perceive eating as toxic. At any rate, YFAS scores are associated with higher levels of negative affect, emotional dysregulation, depression, higher general psychopathology, and more severe eating pathology, as well as higher BMI. So uh, it, again, I think can be a very useful construct. And there have been a, a number of studies uh, using this construct. This is one that comes from the uh, nurse's health study, for, which some of you may be familiar with. And they gave a shortened version of the Yale Food Addiction Scale to a, a large sample size of uh, people in the national nurse study or na nurse's health study. And you see, again, a similar kind of uh, 
relationship but um, between sexual abuse history and physical abuse history. So trauma dose, uh, it's, it's kind of like the complex PTSD slide I showed earlier, but you see uh, as the severity of sexual abuse history goes up, uh, you have higher rates of food addiction, and then also the same is true for physical abuse history. And then when you combine them, you have a much larger uh, degree of food addiction in uh, those with histories of abuse. This is a slide I prepared just showing the number of food addiction citations in PubMed by year. It's only through 2015, but you can see there was a marked increase uh, in the research about food addiction, particularly starting in, in 08, 09 when Ashley Gerhardt first uh, started publishing these data. Food addiction can be thought of as a proxy for eating disorder and obesity severity, PTSD, as well as comorbidity, and I wrote a paper about that, this that uh, appeared in Eating and Weight Disorders uh, last year, if you want to read more about that concept. I want to move on to uh, talking about assessment. And uh, in my view, assessment involves um, screening. And this is a quote from Marsha Linehan that, Linehan that I just love. Um, Marsha Linehan, of course, being the person who developed uh, dialectical behavior therapy. 99% of treatment failures are failures of assessment. I think that is such an awesome statement, and I agree with it very, very much. And a lot of people poo-poo assessment or they poo-poo diagnosis and don't think diagnosis is important. And I, and I think that's just couldn't be further from the truth. Diagnosis uh, is not to meant to label people, but it's meant to help understand. And there, that's why we have research on different diagnostic entities and eating disorders or diagnoses. Uh, here we have the DSM-5 substance-related and addictive disorders. These are all of the ones that appear now in DSM-5. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to go through these quickly, uh, starting with alcohol-related disorders, which are by far the most common, uh, with uh, as many as 29% <clears throat> of the, our population meeting criteria for a lifetime alcohol use disorder in this country. Uh, this is, these are data from the, the, the NISARC uh, which involved the first DSM-5 study of uh, substance-related and addictive disorders, and as well as comorbidity. And you have alcohol use disorder, intoxication, withdrawal, and other. You have caffeine-related disorders, intoxication and withdrawal, and other. You have cannabis-related disorders, cannabis use disorder, intoxication, now, the PD, plus or minus perceptual disorder, some substances cause perceptual disorders or abnormalities. And note withdrawal. A lot of people, a lot of young people in particular, and this is, I think, going to be a growing problem um, in states that are, have and will legalize marijuana, recreational marijuana. Um, uh, cannabis is addicting, plain and simple. There's a, a large literature about this. A lot of people don't think that's true or believe it's, it, or, or believe it, uh, cannabis is safe. Just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's not uh, addicting. Uh, there's hallucinogen-related disorders. Um, there are inhalant-related disorders. There are opioid-related disorders. Again, opioids being one of the uh, sets of drugs or class of drugs that can cause perceptual disturbances. Sedative hypnotics, stimulant-related disorders. Again, you can have intoxication with perceptual disturbances, and particularly we're talking about uh, hallucinations. Tobacco-related disorders. You notice that you don't have tobacco intoxication. Even though people do get an altered sense of consciousness, uh, there is uh, tobacco-related or tobacco use disorder. 
Uh, and then we have uh, two, finally, two important uh, classes. We have other or unknown substance-related disorder, or OSUD. Uh, we have intoxication, withdrawal, and other. And this is where food uh, can possibly fit in uh, as another or other substance-related disorder. Obviously, we need a lot more research, but in my view, this is not to be ignored, and food addiction is not something to just throw out the window. Uh, there are also non-substance-related disorders, in particular gambling disorder, and other uh, process addictions are also being studied and have been reported, uh, such as sexual addiction, but also exercise addiction. There's a literature, as we talked about before, and we found evidence of primary exercise uh, addiction. So in terms of assessment, uh, these are uh, a couple of things that you may want to know about. And these are easy, easily attained on the internet. The Audit C, Alcohol Use Disorder Identification Test. And it um, is simply three questions and scored, uh, as you can see on the slide. And it uh, is scored on a scale of 0 to 12, 0 being uh, no alcohol use, in men, a score of four or more is considered positive, while in women, a score of three or more is considered positive. Uh, generally, the higher the score, the more likely it is that the patient's drinking is affecting his or her health and safety. Simply, how often did you have a drink containing alcohol in the past year? How many drinks did you have on a typical day when you were drinking in the past year? How often did you have six or more drinks on one occasion in the past year? Nice, very nice screening instrument. Uh, NIAAA, National Institute of Alcohol and, and Alcohol Abuse, has published these uh, guidelines for at-risk or hazardous drinking. For men, it's 14 drinks per, uh, per week, and I think most people know that a drink has to do with one ounce of hard liquor, um, 12 ounces of beer, or uh, eight ounces for, of wine. Um, it's important to also note that uh, hazardous drinking can include uh, drinking while driving, uh, working machinery, uh, drinking while pregnant, um, drinking on certain medications, and drinking uh, in, the, uh, in the presence of certain medical or psychiatric conditions. Now there's the DAST-10. It's 10 questions. It's the uh, drug abuse screening test. It's also available uh, in the public domain on the internet. Uh, and they're talking about, again, uh, in the past 12 months, have you used any of the following drugs in excess of the prescribed directions and or non-medical use? And uh, it lists a group of drugs, and it's the usual players, as, as we all know. And it go on, goes on to ask these other questions. And uh, the scoring for the DAST is anything greater than a, a 6 is indicative of dependence, 3 to 5 harmful, one to two low, and zero abstinence. And these are uh, similar scores and their meanings for the audit C on the right. This is all readily available uh, in the public domain. I want to just briefly mention um, the assessment instrument, instruments for trauma exposure and PTSD, since I've uh, you know, emphasize this aspect, an underlying uh, feature in, in the triad. Uh, an excellent resource is ptsd.va.ug, I'm sorry, .gov, uh, and then go to the professional section and assessment. There's also a public assessment. And a lot of times I will send my patients to the uh, public assessment, or I'm sorry, the public uh, side of this ptsd.va.gov website. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, education about trauma and PTSD 
and it helps educate folks uh, about that disorder and the, and the related comorbidity and the consequences. But under assessment there, you will find self-report instruments. And in particular, I want to note the life events checklist for DSM-5, the LEC-5, and the PTSD checklist for DSM-5, the PCL-5. And you can score the PCL-5 to make provisional DSM-5 PTSD diagnoses. There are also interview instruments, probably the most uh, well-known or gold standard used in just about all PTSD clinical trials is the CAPS, or the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale. There's also the Dissociative Disorders Interview Schedule, which I like when you suspect a dissociative component or a concomitant dissociative disorder. It's readily available. It's developed by Colin Ross. It's been adapted to DSM-5. Uh, there's also, of course, the SCID, uh, which is now out in for a DSM-5 version, uh, and that must be purchased, however, by the American Psychiatric Association. This is simply the life events checklist. It is often, I think, a, a, a non-threatening way to, to assess for trauma that you can actually have the patient or client fill out or complete on their own before or, or during a session. And then you can talk about it. And it goes through all of the major um, criterion A types of trauma for PTSD, uh, whether it happened to you or witnessed it or learned about it. And then um, next we have the PCL-5, which uh, asks in the past month, have you ever been, have, how much have you been bothered by these uh, items? that include a lot of the, the DSM-5-related PTSD symptoms. And it goes from not at all to a little bit, moderately, quite a bit, and extremely. Very, very useful. And there are weekly versions of this. Uh, you can administer an initial assessment one, and then you can measure it uh, subsequently as well to, to measure progress or lack thereof. Now. We're coming toward the end of uh, my presentation part uh, of the uh, webcast, uh, podcast rather. I want to uh, talk about the old treatment framework. Uh, so the widely accepted framework in treating uh, trauma, substance use disorders, and mental illness category, uh, or mental illnesses, including eating disorders, categorizes therapies as one of the following. A single uh, approach where a treatment of only one disorder is done. Uh, and unfortunately, this is still true for a lot of the eating disorder programs that we have around the country, where they will treat an eating disorder, but they will not treat a substance use disorder, nor will they treat PTSD or trauma. Uh, they often ascribe to a, a sequential model where they will treat one disorder first and then uh, often refer people to other people to have the second disorder treated. Uh, and then there is the parallel approach, which is uh, less common, where you have concurrent treatment of multiple disorders delivered by separate clinicians or in separate programs that don't necessarily address the interactions between symptoms and disorders. And that, I think, is going to be an important uh, point that I'm going to emphasize next time in terms of the functional significance between disorders, or what is called adaptive function. Uh, the idea that uh, a substance use disorder or a, uh, an eating disorder might actually serve some purpose in the person's development uh, or psychological life. For example, the self-medication hypothesis is, is like that, where uh, people will use these kinds of behaviors in order to numb themselves, in order to dampen other symptoms, often from trauma or PTSD or from a primary anxiety disorder or, or depression or some other life-disrupting event. There are problems with the sequential model, 
of treating these conditions, this triad. And often the patients never make it to the second or third treatment. Uh, people exhaust their resources sometimes in just dealing with their eating disorder, and yet they're left with still with uh, significant substance use disorder or addiction uh, or PTSD. And often the PTSD symptoms get worse when in the eating disorder or SRAD recovery. And treating the, eating, treating the PTSD without addressing the SRAD or the eating disorder may not be effective. Um, there may be discrepancies in treatment approaches for all of these disorders, depending on who you talk to. A lot of people have a favorite kind of uh, approach uh, that they learned or they're familiar with to the exclusion of other, uh, other uh, treatment approaches that they know less about or are inexperienced with. Um, so the problem with sequential models is also that you end up having different therapists uh, in more than one treatment episode, and often you have very different philosophies uh, of these different therapies, therapists who focus on uh, these different disorders. So what uh, I advocate and many others uh, advocate is to ideally treat all conditions concurrently by the same program or clinician. Uh, this integrated model is driven by the hypothesis that the SRAD and the eating disorder are in part a result of trauma and, or PTSD symptoms or that the PTSD symptoms are perpetuating factors for the SRAD and the eating disorder. The reductions in PTSD are more likely to lead to reductions in SRAD or eating disorder than the reverse. But important to include uh, patient preferences. All treatment really needs to be collaborative and um, we have to incorporate or, or deal with the patient's or client's readiness for change. And we're going to talk a lot more about these integrated approaches uh, the next time on April 30th. But uh, I want to leave you with a quote from the great Abraham Maslow. It comes from him in 1996, 1966, I'm sorry. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And uh, that is so true and it's so wrong. <laughs> uh, you need a lot of different tools in your toolbox in order to treat uh, in an integrated fashion these complex and complicated uh, patients. So uh, I'm happy to see that I'm finishing fairly uh, on time. We have a good half an hour for questions or comments. So I want to uh, send it back over to Terry. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you, Dr. Burk. And that was really a wonderful thing. I am just personally. Um, we are able to if any of you would like to uh, enter your questions, that would be wonderful. I'd also like to note um, a thank you, uh, a shout out to Dom Gannon for her wonderful support uh, in us get this started and working properly. So thank you so much, Dom, for all your help with this. Um, and for any of you who aren't familiar uh, with the book that Dr. Burke and edited, uh, Dr. Dennis. It came out in 2014. It offers a lot more depth and additional information around what Dr. Burton was just talking about now. It's called Eating Disorders, Addictions, and Substance Use Disorders, Research, Clinical, and, and Treatment Perspectives. It was edited by the two authors and also includes a lot of information by other experts in the field that you're familiar with. It's, a, it's something I refer to all the time. Um, I see one question here um, by Jamie Lee Pennies, or Panessi. Uh, she's asking if the presentation slides will be available to participants after the webinar. You know, uh, I'm not sure. Dawn, is that something that um, 
that we do as part of the the podcast? Sure. Sure. Yeah. We, yeah. We can make that happen. Yes. What we'll do is we'll post it on the website and have the slides underneath it. Great. Wonderful. Yeah, I know I've go, I went through a lot of the slides, which are busy and contain a lot of information. And, you know, it makes sense to to want to have the slides. I always want those, too, when I go to a, to a presentation. You're welcome. Waiting to see if we have any other questions. Uh, Jamie Lee is thanking you, uh, Dr. Burton, for your generous offer of the slides. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. <laughs> well, if if, um, if no one has a question right now, I, I have a question um, for the audience. It, and it's, you know, what do you think about the concept of food addiction, exercise addiction? And do you incorporate that into your practice? Or what is what has been your um, outlook, philosophy, belief uh, in regard to those issues? Anybody care to respond? They'll need, they'll need to type their answers. I'm so sorry. They're, uh, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to turn it on for them. Well, it's just it's under the chat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I have a question for you, Dr. Burton. Um, you know, as I'm hearing about uh, how complex these patients are and how um, challenging they can be, and uh, in fact, you know, thinking about their suicidality and some other issues. I'm wondering how we can best support and guide clinicians who might feel overwhelmed by the triad or might feel lacking in their expertise to cover all the issues. How do you think we might best support them? Well, uh, I can't emphasize enough um, continuing to get more training uh, in areas that you may not be familiar with or, um, or know about. Um, you know, and I've kind of been a scholar all my life, and uh, I, I highly encourage people to to be curious and and uh, to to seek out seek out knowledge. I think knowledge is power, and I think the, there are lots of ways to do that, and, mm -hmm. uh, including looking at the research and reading and uh, educating yourself and going to conferences and getting uh, continuing education credits. But I think uh, getting supervision. Uh, I think is something supervision and consultation is something that, uh, regarding, regardless of your discipline, is uh, something that it's important to do. And it, it certainly is common in medicine among the different specialties. Uh, when you don't know something or you need a consultation, you call up someone who knows something about that area. You're not, you know, you, nobody knows at all. Um, and so use your colleagues, use your referral sources, use your supervisors, use your former teachers or current teachers. Um, I think we, you know, one thing about the AED community is that we have a lot of expertise about a lot of different things. Uh, there are a lot of special interest groups. There's uh, certainly a, a, a substance uh, abuse uh, interest group or addiction interest group. I forget what it's called exactly, but there's a lot of available information out there within AED and outside of AED. I think that's a great recommendation. So nobody's... Uh, Jamie's, Jamie's nobody yeah. cares to answer Jamie's typing my question Jamie's typing oh, and um, I activated everybody's microphone so um, if everybody if anybody has a question at the top of your screen almost in the center is a little microphone icon next to the speaker icon if you turn it 
if you click on it and turn it green, we should be able to hear you. Awesome. Oh, great. Great. You can you can ask your questions verbally now. Wonderful. If not, go ahead and type. Or type. Yeah, either way. Yes. While, while she's typing, I have to, to tell you, Dr. Burton, not being a subject matter expert at any of this, um, that was very enlightening for me, so I appreciated um, hearing your presentation. It kind of gave me a better sense of uh, the issues and, and some of the challenges that you all face as um, professionals in the field. I really appreciate that, Dawn. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Terry. I have another question. You uh, made reference. Yeah. To do I do, do I use what? I said you made reference for. You know, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing you, Terry. Oh, okay. Can you recommend That's a screening instrument for suicidality? Ah. Uh. I, I don't. I don't really use a screening instrument for suicidality. I, I think that's just part of my clinical interview okay. uh, to ask about it. Uh, there may be instruments, but I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. Uh, you know, suicidality can be such, um, you know, uh, a secretive issue. I think, I think it you know, it, it, it's a matter of weaving it into your clinical uh, therapy or interviewing or assessment. Um, I, I don't know of an instrument. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So I see uh, Jamie Lee, yes. a clinician in private practice specializing in eating disorder. She definitely sees triad clients coming through. That's really validating for me to hear. Good to know. You mentioned it would be good for uh, C patients to see the same, or for patients to see the same clinician for all three conditions. What would you recommend in my situation where we do not necessarily have the capacity or the skill set to treat these other issues? Well, I think it's uh, like we often say, it takes a village, you know, developing a team that you can work with and, and uh, and, and that can complement each other is important. And uh, that's what I would suggest, you know, and, you know, typically in eating disorders, regardless of whether they're substance use or trauma, we have uh, either a psychiatrist, if you're not a, a MD, you, we have a psychiatrist and or primary care doc. Uh, <clears throat> we have a dietitian as well. Uh, some people, uh, have if they're an individual therapist, they refer out for family therapy, although I, that's not my style. I, I do both mm -hmm. uh, in the same patients. But um, I think developing a team that kind of complements uh, the areas that, that uh, are necessary to meet the, the clinical needs of the person you're seeing is, is the answer. And I think uh, some, you know, depending on where you are, and how small a community you have, you may not have access, and sometimes people have to travel to get expertise. But I think um, I think collaboration is really the key. And your second question is, what do I think of the suicidality module of the mini? I'm glad you reminded me of the mini. I've used the mini. I often use the mini to assess bipolar disorder. Um, you know, when I'm not sure if someone is truly bipolar or not, or bipolar two. Uh, I do recall having used the suicidality module of the mini uh, on occasion. Uh, and I, I like it a lot. I like the mini a lot. It's a lot, use, a lot more user friendly than the skid is. The problem also is, uh, is getting access to the mini. Uh, it, like the skid, is something that often you have to pay for unless you know somebody who has it. 
do you use the many yourself, uh, Jamie? Jamie Lee? So you say, yes, we do. You're apparently in, in a group or uh, where you can collaborate or in a, what kind of setting are you in? Mm. So, so clinicians at the private practice level, that's awesome to hear that you guys are using, uh, you know, the many and, uh, and probably other psychometric instruments as well. You must, I'm guessing you're a psychologist. Yes, she says. <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. It, it really is. And, um, you know, psychologists in particular are typically more trained than psychiatrists and other clinicians to, to use psychometric assessment in instruments. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that is really good. And, and given my, you know, the fact that I had some research training, I was privy to uh, to become acquainted and to use uh, many instruments. And I, I think they can be enormously clinically useful, particularly when you have such complex cases and you're uh, trying to sort, sort out what's what diagnostically. Yes, that, that would just be a good way to make sure you've asked all the right questions. Um, yep. I often work with a licensed clinical, clinical dependency counselor because I don't have as yeah. much expertise in addictions and I get so much support by doing that. Um, and of course, I, I have a lot of expertise in eating disorders and trauma. I think it's such a good idea to just use uh, support and, and use a team that has the expertise in areas that you're lacking. So I really appreciate that guidance. It, it reminds me of um, Socrates. I only know that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we have to, you know, it's important to know that you don't know things because nobody knows at all. And as I said earlier, you know, consultation, collaboration, supervision is really essential to being a good clinician, in my view. These are complex, really hard to treat folks. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, by no means is this an easy uh, area to deal with. But it's so common. Yes. You know, as, I, as I've, uh, you know, indicated earlier. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make this, um, I'll, I'll take this risk and just say that, you know, people, patients with eating disorders and in any mental disorder often lie <laughs> about their, uh, behaviors that they don't want people to know about or they're not ready to deal with. Uh, eating disorder patients uh, often lie about their eating disorder behaviors or they'll minimize them and they'll often uh, certainly not volunteer information if it's not asked of, of, of specifically. And that's true for substance use. It's true for trauma and PTSD and uh, you know, don't ask, don't tell is, is often the philosophy of a lot of folks. They're not going to volunteer this information. Yes, I, I've definitely seen that, Tim. And, and I think one reason for that is if they've had interpersonal trauma, especially uh, yeah. early in life, they have a lot of difficulty with trust. And so yes. in a way that assessment needs to be ongoing as you're hopefully building a relationship and they are uh, developing some trust in you and therefore be able to tell you more. That's a hugely important uh, issue uh, that you bring up, uh, Terry, and I completely agree, couldn't agree more. And that's where building the therapeutic alliance is, is really important. Now, um, it also brings up the issue of drug screens uh, and the use of drug screens. And, you know, if you're working in a program or a group uh, or with a, if you're not a physician, uh, you know, uh, some form of MD or DO, then you can ask them to do drug screens. And, and you know, people can get over-the-counter drug screens just as, uh, as a cursory. You can get 
anyone can get uh, a breathalyzer. If you highly suspect somebody is using alcohol or drugs, you know, you are within your clinical um, rights to ask them to, you know, to, to blow <laughs> a breathalyzer or to, uh, to pee in a cup. And, uh, and get a screen. Now, that may be offensive to some people, but again, it's part of our job to do good assessments, and not everybody likes what or is going to like what we say, say or do. So again, it's more how you do it. And again, we're going to talk more about that in the next, uh, in the next podcast. But asking the question, not so much, you know, not you're going to have a drug screen, but would you be willing to get a drug screen? You know, throwing it out that way in more of a motivational interviewing kind of style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people will then come clean. Uh, you, you don't need a drug screen. I, you know, I smoked pot yesterday or I, or I did cocaine or whatever it is. You know, um, a lot of the things, though, that people use, uh, you know, for weight loss, like caffeine or energy drinks, you don't pick up on a drug screen. You know, any comments about anything I'm saying, feel free. <laughs> You don't have to agree with everything I say. In a sense, some of this might be controversial because we don't. Have I'm sure. Sense. No doubt, and that's okay. When I, I'll just share, you know, uh, something about my own personal professional development. You know, when I was starting out as a psychiatrist, I really had a lot of negative countertransference toward uh, substance abusing patients and uh, patients with addictions. Uh, I, I didn't particularly want to treat them. And I, I have to say and confess that I avoided treating them. And I, I think that's a common um, kind of attitude, and just just like we know, there are colleagues out there who do not like and avoid treating uh, eating disorder patients because uh, often they don't really uh, know what to do. They don't have any expertise in that area. Uh, they feel out of their their league. Um, but I think the more you know, and the more you come to appreciate, you know, what's behind these disorders and the pain that people feel. Uh, the more compassion one can develop and uh, the more you can get in touch with your own countertransference issues. I think any number of these things can be very scary, uh, dealing with suicidal patients mm -hmm. uh, as well, dealing with, you know, with borderline quote-unquote patients, which to me is a, a term often overused. Mm -hmm when there, uh, particularly when there are major uh, Axis one disorders. And that reminds me again of how, how helpful it can be to work in a team or work collaboratively with others in your community a lot like what Jamie Lee was saying. I, I, Jamie Lee, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I get the impression that in your private practice, there's a lot of collaboration amongst the, the practitioners there. Is that correct? Yep, she says. Yes, yes collaboration among clinicians. Uh, but all, all are only, she say, all are psychologists, not just only, don't say only. That's pretty cool. <laughs> psychologists are great. Um, I work with them all the time. I, you know, 
uh, respect psychologists. I learn a lot from psychologists. Uh, it's just a matter of developing. Um, now, the problem is there, are su there is such a shortage of psychiatrists, period, um, mm -hmm. in, in the country. And uh, I saw a very shocking statistic just this week that three out of five psychiatrists are over the age of 55 years old. And so it's uh, not only is our uh, population increasing and mental illness is not going anywhere, but the, the, the number of psychiatrists uh, is, is very rapidly decreasing. And, uh, and e even if you find one, they, not, they don't necessarily feel comfortable treating eating disorders or, or addictions. Right. A small, small percentage of them do. <clears throat> we have about real, five more minutes um, for questions or comments. Um, so, Jamie, I, I guess everyone can see the typing, right? Oh. Jamie Lee says um, they have no MDs or psychiatrists on the premises. Uh, but they do have good relationships with a number of psychiatrists, uh, general practitioners, and dietitians with a high level of experience in treating eating disorders. How, how about the addiction piece, the substance abuse piece? So Jamie Lee says we really do try to use a multi-disciplinary uh, approach as much as possible. Bravo. That is a bravo and fortunate for your patients. Yeah. And that, that's, I think, something that the Academy has uh, emphasized you know, since it's um, found, you know, forming. And continues to. No addiction therapist, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's often the case. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it uh, you know, you're on this, you're on this podcast, Jamie Lee, uh, which is, which is great because you're, you know, your limitations and it's important that we all do. And you're attempting to learn as much as you can about it and expanding your comfort zone. And that's something that I encourage uh, all clinicians who work with eating disorders to do because we, you know, we really don't just treat eating disorders. And that's something that I've, you know, talked a lot about in my career that uh, to do eating disorders well, you have to be comfortable with you know, all of the eating and related disorders that come with it, all of the comorbidities that come with it, because comorbidity is such the rule rather than the exception in this business, in this profession. Yeah. Do you agree? Terry? Well, this is Terry. Yes, I certainly agree. And, you know, I think in terms of breadth of knowledge, eating disorder, uh, Specialists have probably some of the broadest uh, skill sets of uh, any people in the yeah. mental health field because we we just have to be able to do that. And that question is for everyone. You know, you you too, Jamie Lee. Um, do you do you agree that comorbidity is the rule rather than the exception? Yes, very rarely does she see just an eating disorder. It's, it's I, extremely I, I, rare. I ask that question, yeah, to a lot of people and I get very similar answers. Yeah. And I think the, the folks who have just kind of homogeneous eating disorders, they, they do exist, but I think those 
folks tend to either get better on their own or they respond to lesser levels of intervention um, and don't really need uh, higher levels of care or to see even a therapist. A lot of people get better on their own, believe it or not, who are, have uncomplicated eating disorders. There's some psychoeducation right. often. Yeah, they go online, they get self-help. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. Right. So our patients tend to be the, compl the complex ones that you've been describing today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And particularly if you are a specialist in the eating disorder field, I think that is even more true. We have a kind of a skewed experience to the more complicated and, and severe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we need to wrap up now. Thank you, everyone, for being on this uh, webinar, for participating, for listening. Jamie Lee, really appreciate uh, all the information that you shared about your own practice. Um, yes. I hope you'll Thank be you so much. willing to join us for our follow-up webinar. You're, you're breaking up, uh, Terry. Okay, I'm sorry. I hope you'll be able to join us. Uh, for the follow-up seminar webinar that Dr. Brewerton will be holding, talking more about treatment and treatment modalities and treatment approaches, that's going to take place on Monday, April 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I know that Do uh, Don Gannon will be sending out reminders. You can also... Thanks again, everybody, for, for uh, showing up. Yes. And listening. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.